So today, I thought when I was introducing Ann Alice, I was going to be telling you she's an associate professor, and she's got this interesting program in the epigenetics of inheritance. We've established a linear database using biobanking, and it's going to figure out why people that are predisposed to allergy eventually become allergic. But I, I was pleased and surprised when I saw that, in fact, we're going to be talking about the power of social media, and hopefully Ann's going to be telling us how it can be used to support uh, chiefs of medicine rather than how to overthrow the current administration. So <laughs> without further ado, Ann, uh, thank you very much. I look forward to this uh, talk. Thanks very much, Dr. Archer, and you're absolutely right. I came this close to talking about cord blood predictors of future allergy because that would have been so much easier, quite frankly, because I've given that talk before. Uh, but in the spirit of, of departmental rounds and uh, trying to make uh, topics, I, I thought it would be helpful to have a topic that had really universal appeal. And I'm very pleased to see uh, we actually do have a fairly multidisciplinary audience here today. Uh, just quickly by a show of hands, how many of you are here today because you heard about it either directly or indirectly through a social media source? Just raise your hands. Okay, so I've almost proven my point and I can just quit right now, but not quite. So, um, so hopefully by the end of this round, uh, you will begin to understand the various social media outlets that are available uh, currently for use in the healthcare setting and just contemplate developing your own professional social media strategy. I'm by no means here to be an evangelist and say you all must get on Twitter or Facebook or what have you, but just to introduce this community to the concept of what can be done in healthcare social media. So I was really tempted to call my talk this, and I'll let you contemplate what that means, and if you don't figure it out by the end of the talk, feel free to come up and I'll, I'll fill you in. So what is social media? So generally speaking, when we want to have a good definition, we all go to what is technically considered a, a micro blog or a, a social media source, which is Wikipedia. And really, this refers to interacting with people on the internet where they create, share, exchange, and comment amongst themselves in virtual communities and networks. So it's an interaction. There's engagement. It isn't just you put up a website and that's it. It's an, it's, there's communication and sharing and exchange and engagement between the various users. And there are various internet-based applications that build on this ideology and have technological foundations that allow for this creation and generation of um, user-generated content. So examples include blogs, which are websites where you do post your opinions, thoughts, op-eds, and yet there's the opportunity for those who are reading the website to comment back, and then there's an exchange back and forth between all of the various people who have read this particular content social networks as well as content networks. And I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with Facebook. Now, I personally have gone through a love-hate relationship with Facebook. I joined when I was a student uh, at McMaster University back when you couldn't get into Facebook. If you didn't have an academic email, it was locked down for just university purposes. And I thought it was a fantastic social networking exchange, which is exactly what it was designed to do. And then it sort of exploded and became this you know, commercial thing where people could post ads and it became very frustrating for me and I locked down my account and I said I'm never going to do that again. Of course, if anyone here has tried to delete your Facebook page, they never really delete you. But since that time, uh, there have been many more sites that have surfaced, including LinkedIn, which is really the Facebook for professionals. So this is really not a site where you just go and chat with people. It's a way to connect with other professionals within your discipline, and it's really like an online CV that you create for yourself. Since that time, Twitter has come along, and when I first heard about Twitter, I thought, what a monumental waste of time. Who wants to know what Paris Hilton is thinking every minute of the day? Uh, but so again, Twitter, the concept is this is microblogging. So you're putting out a thought in 140 characters or less. And what I didn't realize until I started engaging in some of these sites is that you can post links to other things. So it isn't just, here's my thoughts on anaphylaxis. It's, biphasic anaphylaxis occurs in up to 10% and there's a link to an article that proves that and it's your way of sharing an educational moment with whomever your audience happens to be. I'm sure everyone is familiar with YouTube and again it's got lots of uh, <coughs> recreational uses probably much more so than a professional use but yet it's important to realize there's lots of educational videos patient education videos how to use a nasal spray effectively how to administer an epinephrine auto injector all these things can be found on YouTube. And in the meantime, there are myriads that are coming along, sort of copying the, the strategy, uh, trying to also capture some of the audience. But uh, the first four really are the, are the powerhouses. 
So why should physicians even care about this? Well, as of 2012, social media is now the most powerful source for news updates. There are huge numbers of individuals who don't read newspapers anymore. They follow their RSS or their Twitter feeds. And so social media offers practically unlimited engagement opportunities to interact with other colleagues, particularly colleagues that aren't here in your centre, but even more so colleagues that are in your centre that you didn't even realise were involved in some of these networking opportunities as well. Research collaborators, it's been tremendous from my perspective to touch base with other people who are involved in the same sorts of research that I do. Lots of physicians use this as a way to communicate with their patients and everyone gets a little edgy about that because there are certain things that you do need to exercise some caution and we'll talk about that before the end of the rounds. Uh, but this really does offer a tremendous way to impart more information to your patients than you have time to communicate in your 15 to 30 one hour office assessment. Whatever your normal time is for interacting with a new consult, I'm sure there's lots of times we've all felt where it's just not enough. And so being able to pass information along to patients through one of these mechanisms can be extremely useful. To me, it's a huge breakthrough in terms of my ability to explain to a grant aiding agent how I'm going to translate the knowledge of my research because all kinds of people read what I post and follow up with questions. Oh, am I understanding what you just said? And you can go back and forth and say, actually, no, what I meant was this. Um, but really, it's, it's allowing for new studies. They get picked up by a press release and people retweet it and forward it on through either their Facebook or whatever their site is they're using. But the, the new research findings are all over the place instantly. And it's just dram dramatic to me and so much more effective than just expecting everyone who goes to you know, a big international meeting to suddenly realize that what you've done in your research is important and worth talking about. It has impact on policymakers. All the politicians are on these sites and they all pay attention to what gets said. A lot of MPPs will follow local constituents. They care about what we're trying to communicate to them. Uh, so this does have in influence. And, and I'll just segue into a recent example of why voters might want to pay attention, why physicians should care about voters. So a couple cases in point. So I'm not the only one by any means. So most of you will recognize this handsome fellow who, this is his face, no, this is LinkedIn account. So again, just focuses on um, who he is, and, but he's highlighted now a new title in his job description that he's also candidate for CMA president. So he's quite wisely made a very similar message on his Facebook page. It's not just Dr. Simpson, it's Dr. Simpson for CMA president, helping to get that message out. Again, consistent messaging through the different sites. And his Twitter account, again, is focused on this and he's continuing to post anything related to the upcoming CMA election and hopefully all of you will have considered voting for him uh, given that it's been a long time since we've actually had a, a Queen's candidate involved. And he also has his own website with blog that also talks about all the issues that are related to the upcoming election. So certainly it's, it's being up to, there is uptake locally. Um, there's somebody in the room who I know happens to have a blog that uh, is well backed up with his new Twitter account. And again, so it's again a way of communicating with the members of the department, but also the entire Queen's community and, and hopefully patients at large. Kingston General Hospital, our institution, is no uh, stranger to this uh, media and they've developed a great strategy. So they have a website that I'm sure everyone's familiar with. But they also have a Twitter account that has very similar, again, images and messaging. So it's very consistent across all of their different ways of communicating with the patient community here in Kingston. Uh, the University Hospitals Foundation also has uh, social media ways to engage with the community. And of course, our own CEO, Leslie Thompson, has a very active Twitter account with a lot of followers who are interested in what it is that we're doing here. Uh, so it's not like it's, we're total strangers to this concept locally. When we talk about healthcare social media, you'll often see this abbreviated as HCSM, or in the, and when we're talking specifically about Canada, they add on the CA at the end. Part of the reason why there are so many abbreviations is this Twitterverse of it's got to be 140 characters or less. So we thought we were bad for having acronyms in, in general medicine. There's just as many acronyms that become popular in these types of websites. And definitely the uptake across healthcare facilities and providers is, is certainly varied across Canada and, and across uh, various institutions, but it's certainly increasing. There are definite gurus in this field, and I have borrowed a lot of my ideas and uh, slides from uh, Dr. Vez Dimoff, who's at the University of Chicago, and he uh, has uh, 
two blogs actually, one that's based on physician education, the other based on patient education, and he links those to two different Twitter accounts. One is Act Dr. Vez, which is trying to target uh, doctors, and he's one of, one of the first ones into this game, so he's uh, nailed the, the Twitter address at allergy for patients who are looking to get more information about allergic diseases. The Mayo Clinic is considered one of the superstars of, of institutional uh, social media engagement. They actually founded the Center for Social Media back in 2010 and have unofficially, as a result, become the global face of social media for the healthcare industry. And, and again, they've got a really easy uh, Twitter handle of at Mayo Clinic. And I also can't help but mention Dr. Bercy Mesco, who is an MD PhD who has really does, does, this is what his whole career is, is he teaches people um, healthcare social media strategies and he has a website called webcena.com and it's, he offers online courses and certification in healthcare social media. So, I mean, in my world, it's everyone knows at Dr. Vesk for allergy and these are the other two sort of major players across uh, other sp subspecialties. So the degree to which an institution or a personal professional will participate in these types of activities is obviously a personal choice. And it's been interesting for me as I communicate with medical students and with residents and other professionals, everyone's got their one source that they are happy with and they don't want to delve into others. So for me, uh, Twitter works for me and that's where I put all of my you know, efforts into. I'm, not, I'm still not a big Facebook fan, but I've linked my Twitter to my Facebook so that if you happen to be a Facebook person, you'll see my updates that way. I've had other people who just, no, Facebook is more than enough and I don't want to get into anything else, but I'm just gonna pre present to you today what is described as sort of the rock star version. So this is pretty close to what Chris Simpson is trying to do with his CMA uh, election, uh, but this would be how you could really incorporate this into all aspects of your practice and really become a social media superstar. So of course I, I've taken this with the permission of Dr. Vez uh, Dimoff because he really in, in our field is the, uh, is the guru of this and uh, his website is uh, allergycases.org and it's, you see cases blog at the top from the University of Chicago and, and he really takes it to, the, you can see he posts on everything. So he is an, also an internist and he posts on every single subspecialty but obviously uh, he focuses most on allergy in terms of what I, I follow along. So he describes this interlocking cycles and that there's a cycle of online information and physician education and this links into a cycle of patient education. And the two then feed back on each other and you allow for perpetual education on both sides of the sphere. So again, this is the rock star version, but what, this is literally what he does every day. So he has information that comes in from what's called RSS feeds or relatively simple um, streams. So he uses Google Reader, but you can also just get your information from following various people on Twitter. If you have certain Google searches that automatically give you updates into your email. Um, some people choose to listen to podcasts, um, but then what, what's key is you get your new information and you share that through one of these major streams. So he puts it on all three because as I say, he's, he's the rock star of this stuff. So he, he posts it on Twitter, he puts it to his Facebook page, he's in Google Plus as well. But again, the idea is that you're sharing it. So you've learned something useful today and you share it with others. And what you'll find is then you get feedback from your followers. Uh, they'll say, wow, that was great, and I'm gonna follow that along. So there's this whole language of Twitter and there's a the concept of retweeting. So I read something that Bob Connolly posted yesterday and I think that's really interesting, so I'm gonna retweet it and pass it along to all the people that follow me. And we get that information going in the healthcare sphere and that way patients are learning more and, our phys and physicians and other colleagues are learning more at the same time. When you're really into this full time, like Vez is, you publish it in your home-based blog. So you can write a blog post using ideas that you've learned that day from your various sources. Um, he posts three times a week, and then once you've written your blog, you then announce it on your Facebook or your Twitter page. You make sure people know about it one way or the other. Um, and then once you've done that, you go back to step one and you learn some more things and you redo it. So one of the things that Vez does, and I fully confess, I don't do any of this heavy stuff, um, is he'll read an article in say Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. He summarizes it in three paragraphs, gives it a title that's less than 140 characters and then posts that. So I'm done my CME for the day because I read what he's written about this article. I don't even have to read the full article unless I'm really, really interested and I need those nitty gritty details. 
The key is this links into the cycle of patient education. So when patients come in for a clinic visit, you have your various educational tools that you use on site in the clinic, whether they be paper handouts, pictures on your iPad, if you just open up the computer that's in the office to show them, this is what urticaria is. What you're describing to me doesn't actually sound like hives. Then you've got your printouts that you've already done, or if you want, you can have them take a picture with their cell phone if they don't want to carry around paper. Um, but the key here is that for the really, as I say, these are the rock stars who will have their own website, and I don't do this, I fully confess. But on your website, you can post these videos, your action plans, um, and distribute those to those updates that you make to these patient education websites, again, to your various social media strategies. And again, then when the patient comes back, they've had a chance to see all of your educational material and they can follow up with any questions they still have afterwards. And the cycle of patient education has been shown in rigorous in studies where they've actually evaluated the difference in patient care before a physician starts this kind of strategy and after, and or just comparing outcomes from two different physicians in the same clinic, one who uses this strategy and one who doesn't. And the various outcomes have been summarized in this uh, uh, acronym, equals. So, you know, the patients describe that they feel engaged and energized with their provider. Uh, they feel their quality of life has improved. Their understanding of their condition is improved compared to what they're able to get out of that five-minute office visit. And again, you got to remember, Vez is in the States, so they're spending a little bit less time. Um, what they describe as affinity. So again, you've got better physician-patient relationships. Um, in the States where you know, it's self-referral to practices, it's been shown that this helps to increase referrals to the practice, not as relevant in the Canadian system. But what I thought was key are these studies that show lower rates of emergency room visits and hospital admissions. So again, his studies that he's looked at have to do with allergic outcomes. So there's been uh, decreased hospitalizations for asthma, uh, an improvement in the use, incorrect use of inhalers. And uh, again, he, uh, he thinks that really it's the videos you're posting that make a big difference here. And it does result obviously then in savings, not only for the patient, but also for the healthcare system. He points out that it's about the patient's best interest. So this is, the purpose of the cycle is not to make money. So it's not just to generate more patients for your practice. And, and it's been well uh, documented by the Mayo Clinic as well that they're, out, they're doing this because they want to be leaders in social media, uh, not because having a competitive advantage. For them, it's all about the patient and that whatever you do, make sure you're doing this for the best interest of the patient. And that's your only reason for doing it. But there's no doubt that social media makes the union of forces uh, much more broadly practical than it was previously in any time in history. So I'm sure you're sitting here thinking, do I really need to do this? Seriously? Um, but it's important to recognize that if you think of Facebook as a country, it's got more than 750 million citizens. There's that many people on this uh, site. Twitter has more than 250 million users. LinkedIn is over 200 million now. Google Plus is fastest growing. It's still on the, the, the back end, though, of, of, the, of the uptake. And, you know, lots of people who, who do this all the time would say the answer is yes. But my personal take is that the answer is personal. Uh, but certainly, I think, worth contemplating. And I hope that you just sort of digest on some of these thoughts I have shared with you today. I think it's interesting that the number of tweets actually predicts future citations for a specific journal article. This has been shown um, because so Twitter really is becoming essential for both authors and publishers of scientific literature. If that journal article has been highly tweeted, it's 11 times more likely to be cited by other users than less tweeted articles. It makes sense. I saw it on my Twitter account. I remember that paper. I'm going to cite it when I'm writing my next review article. And in fact, there's been a study that was published in um, Medical Internet Research that showed that top cited articles could be predicted uh, from top tweeted articles with over 93% specificity and 75% sensitivity. And in this one article, they actually tried to generate a so-called twin pack factor as opposed to an impact factor, which is an interesting concept and I'm sure uh, will eventually make its way into our lingo. But again, it, it shows what studies and what research findings really resonate with the public. And again, to me, that's sort of the whole point of knowledge translation, which is what we say we're trying to do when we do basic science research. So in terms of the possibilities and the probabilities, so I would hope that everyone is here probably already doing this. You're using the internet somehow to learn and stay up to date. So whether you're doing this with web feeds, whether you're doing it by reading other people's blogs or following certain people's Twitter accounts, uh, again, you can use podcasts or persistent searches to uh, just feed in new items into your inbox. But one of the things that is, is also possible is to use the internet for patient communication. Um, so you can post patient education diagrams, videos, your ready-made patient education brochures that you probably already have in your clinics, just scan them and, and put them online. 
Um, and again, the other possibility, which is, is out there to be uh, complete, uh, would be to promote your practice and collaborations. Uh, so again, there are things like WordPress or blogger.com where you can start a website for free. Um, if you start a Twitter account or a professional Facebook page and use Google Docs to help uh, assist with research collaboration. So this is where you post something that's open for edit by others and it allows you to work that way in order to come up with your finalized product. And you can also use things like Office Calendar and creating the diagrams for your patient education purposes. So all I'm going to do in terms of if anyone, if the people in your room who really haven't done any of this and they're like, okay, maybe I'll try this. How do I get started? To me, the key, if you're only going to do one or two, uh, LinkedIn is really, I think, it's, it's easy and it's really the closest to being essential of all of them. As I mentioned, this is the Facebook for professionals. So this is your opportunity to, to brag about yourself online in a way that's not um, unprofessional, for lack of a better word. And then I'll also just show you a little bit about Twitter and why I think the hashtag may be the holy grail of knowledge translation. So the LinkedIn site looks like this. And again, you just would literally click on sign in or join today, whichever the case may be. And I'm shamelessly borrowing from people who I knew would be at the presentation. So this is Dr. Connolly's uh, LinkedIn site. So again, you see his position. You, he's written a summary of what he does and you can see his various experiences in the past. What's interesting about LinkedIn is that people can write endorsements or talk about the work they've done with you. So again, then we'll get to somebody in the audience here who has written a recommendation for Dr. Connolly about his work as an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics. This is Vez's uh, LinkedIn site, and again, he also has uh, everything that he posts on uh, whether it's his Facebook or his Twitter account shows up as an activity for him. So you can see the first thing that comes up is, here's what I think about drug allergy articles for, for this year. So as I mentioned, Vez is a rock star. I wouldn't worry about trying to be just like him. And, and the other thing that LinkedIn shows is various connections. So people that you've worked with, people that you know or would like to know, uh, show up as what are called connections in this uh, networking site. So again, it's, 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 it's using professional language. It's, they're not your friends, they're your connections, they're your colleagues, that kind of thing. And the other thing that's interesting is I really like the fact that uh, if LinkedIn also has, if the institutions have joined LinkedIn, then the logos show up as part of uh, the, um, the background of the person in, in question. So in terms of Twitter, if you're getting started, again, it's very simple. You literally just need to make up a name. You can either use your real name or you can use uh, an acronym. And you have an email address, and that's all you need to do. So when you first get in, it'll say, welcome, naive user. Get started in less than 60 seconds. And, build, and pick some people to follow. Now, I think Neil Patrick Harris must pay Twitter an awful lot of money because he always shows up as the first person you can choose to follow, and I don't know why. Um, but you can go through and figure out who you think is, is useful for you to follow, whether it's Queen's University, at KGH Connect. Um, and then once you've built your list of followers, you'll then be able to see what it is that they're posting. And so every single one of these things that are a color is a link to something else that you can now read about. So Cancer Care Ontario has some information about tobacco. You click on that link and there's the article. So again, it is more than just people talking about what they did last night. There's lots of people who do that too, but don't follow them. And you can just only follow those things that you find useful and interesting. Um, so in terms of looking for healthcare social media, again, up at the top, there's this little search icon and you just type in literally the hashtag or pound symbol before the acronym of whatever it is you're trying to learn more about. So you can type in literally anything here. You can type in HCSM to learn about healthcare social media. You can type in, um, I've got it on another slide, but you can type in hashtag allergy. You could type in hashtag fill in the blank and you'll find things that other people have posted on that topic. So is this hashtag really the holy grail of knowledge translation? Well, for example, if I type in hashtag allergy, there's all of these postings from various um, you know, international organizations that have posted articles that are of relevance to people who either have allergies or people doing research in this field. And again, it's instant you know, information that's, per, that's sent right to you. And you, again, you just click on any of the links. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to demonstrate what my research findings are. So anyone who follows me now sees the latest article that I just posted. Again, this is a little bit um, artificial because <laughs> it's not that new of a paper. But again, it's the, uh, the concept that it's your way of getting your research findings out to those who are following you and the, the, uh, the Twitterverse's world in general. 
and it just when you click on the link, there's the article right there. So it's really that simple a process to find out what's going on in, in the field you're working at. The other thing that's done quite commonly is what's called live tweeting of meetings. And I know there's some people in the audience who said they were going to live tweet my presentation. So what happens is basically for the abbreviation of the meeting, there's a hashtag before it. And then anyone who's at that meeting who chooses to live tweet is always sending little updates about, I'm at, the, um, I'm at uh, ASH and Dr. James just said that von Willebrand's disease is um, top, type three is the most common. And you send that out and people read that and you're like, oh, isn't that interesting? and somebody might pass it along. So you can find what's going on in all of these international meetings without even being there. So if you don't get to make it that year, you can follow what the proceedings are just by following the hashtag. So uh, I mentioned the American College of Emergency Physicians because it's the most tweeted meeting ever. Um, and again, so you're following live updates from the speakers, 140 characters at a time. And most people will always put the name of the speaker they're quoting so that people know that this isn't just me saying this. this is you know, Dr. Lee or Dr. James who said it. And again, so I tried to find a really good meeting that's on right now. The, the closest one to this audience is uh, Medical Students Education 2003. And so they're posting under the hashtag uh, MSC13. So what about medical education? Well, as, as always in the world of Twitter, there's a hashtag for that. So you can follow hashtag MedEd, and there's many others. Uh, those of you who are here from the first year class know that I've been trying to send some clear teaching points through UGME AI. Um, but really it just comes down to finding, uh, you do your search again up here in the search box and anyone who's talking about medical education uh, has some things. So again, here's some advice for medical students about how to choose your specialty. Uh, so the, um, the final point that I want to raise, and I deliberately lay, left lots of time for, for comments and questions, is to beware of the dark side. Um, I'm sure we've all hesitated to be involved in a lot of social media applications because we've heard of the nightmares that go along with it. So just some good ground rules to keep in mind. Write as if your boss and your patients are reading your blog or your tweets every day. So don't say anything on any of your social media sites that you wouldn't want Dr. Archer to hear. I think that sort of makes common sense, but I think sometimes people forget. You get caught up in the, the social aspect of it and it's easy to, to lose sight of what's um, important versus not in terms of uh, subtleties. Obviously, you need to comply with HIPAA, so you're never going to publish anything that has any identifiable information without patient permission. And I would just say, just don't do that. I wouldn't go there. Consider using your name and your credentials, though, on your blog and other social media accounts so people know that you're a credible source of information as opposed to just someone else out there offering an opinion. Uh, but if your blog is work-related, it's best to let your employer know. And uh, certainly if you're a KGH employee, uh, KGH is establishing its social media policy, so make sure that you review it and you're working in compliance with it. And as I mentioned, if there are any employee social media guidelines, make sure you're complying with them. It can never hurt to use a disclaimer. Uh, if it's particularly on a, on a blog page where you have room for this, is that all the opinions expressed or not of the employer, information is for medical education only, and it's not a substitute for medical advice. Lots of people in the sort of Twitterverse understand that and they won't hold you to everything you say as an actual medical advice. But if you've got this, then you're covered and you don't have to worry about that ultimate uh, problem. So this is exactly the kind of thing that I don't think anyone in this room would do, but this is what you definitely don't want to do on your Facebook page is post pictures of yourself in the doctor's lounge with a beer or uh, certainly not uh, afterwards. So, there's no doubt that social media is here to stay. It's not like it's going to go away and we can all just pretend that it, it never happened. Um, and healthcare social media is an emerging trend that cutting edge institutions that have embraced, including Kingston General Hospital and Queen's University. Physicians could all become more engaged to a certain degree uh, by picking up another little piece of the social media uh, outlets that are out there and contemplating your role in healthcare social media. And so uh, what I'll do is, uh, as you'll notice that we've got uh, KGH is, uh, is filming this video, so we'll be posting it about one to two weeks, and that's a good resource and reference for you. But I also have some Lancet articles and some really important websites that you may find useful if you want to learn more information about this. As I mentioned, I thought there might be lots of questions and, and concerns and you're crazy and all that kind of stuff, so by all means, uh, jump in. Thank you very much for your attention.